live there. All right, go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. Uh, we'll start reading there in a little bit, but at least if you're there, you'll be ready. All right, I got one more thing I'm going to write right here. Uh, let's do this. Okay. All right. So I have an interest. I have a lesson that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and it's going to be a little bit different than the typical lessons or sermons that I preach. So, if you hate this Sunday school or this Sunday's lesson, don't worry. We'll be back to our regular scheduled content <laughs> the following weeks. But um, I wanted to give you some things this morning uh, from the Bible that pertain to nations and how God deals with nations and uh, hopefully be able to discern maybe what God is doing in our country right now. Uh, the, I, the concept of God dealing with nations isn't just an Old Testament thing. God is still dealing with nations and doing things with nations, even into the New Testament, albeit God's primary focus is on the individual, obviously. Uh, but as we all know, things in this country have gotten to be pretty insane lately, uh, especially in the last few months. And 2020 can pretty much already go down as the cra craziest year in U.S. history. And uh, we're only in July. <laughs> we still have five more months to go in, in the year 2020. Uh, the level of governmental corruption is certainly off the charts. And the level of social unrest right now is off the charts. The level of division in this country, they say it's never been this bad in the history of our country. Uh, the level of disrespect for people in authority is just incredible. Nothing that I've ever seen, at least in my lifetime. Uh, the level of crime is off the charts. The level of governmental overreach is uh, off the charts. And the level of uh, conservative censorship is off the charts. And so... One thing I want to point out before we really get going into this, this sermon this morning is I want you to be careful as an individual uh, not to get used to this kind of thing. We've been seeing some pretty crazy things and some major uh, political and social unrest in the last three and a half years, and you need to be sure to not let these things become the new normal for you. The world wants you to accept this kind of uh, corruption as well. It's just normal. That's just the way it goes. And you just need to get used to it. You need to make sure that this doesn't become the new normal for you. You cannot let yourself become numb to this level of insanity, because when you start to become numb to it, it means that you're starting to slip into insanity yourself <laughs> because it is insanity to not be bothered by all the things that you see and to not recognize that there's a major problem in this country and with the things that are going on. These things should bother you. And that's a very normal reaction to see your country starting to succumb to very uh, uh, wicked rulers and uh, very communist and satanic ideals. That should bother you. That isn't something that you should just be like, well, you know, <laughs> it's just the way it goes. Uh, don't let that become the new normal. If you accept non-normal behavior as normal, it is indication that you yourself are becoming a little bit abnormal in your mind. Okay? If you accept non-normal behavior as normal, it is an indication that your mind is slowly being broken. Uh, it's like it's being hacked. It's being overridden. And in communist countries, if you know anything about history, uh, in communist countries, they have what are called re-education camps. They have those right now in China. And uh, there they get you to accept their version of reality in a concentration camp. Okay? That's the whole point of it. They can kill you, yes. They can shoot you and throw you in a ditch like the Nazis did and like the uh, Serbians did over there, uh, you know, and the, and the Roman Catholics did in Croatia in, in the World War II. They can just line you up, put a bullet in the back of your head, and throw you in a ditch. That's easy. But with these very satanic groups, what they like to do is they like to change your thinking. They like to turn you into a mindless zombie, basically, and use you for whatever they want or get you to think like them. They want to convert you. Isn't that what we want as Christians? We want to convert people to Jesus Christ, right? So if you have a very satanic person, you know what they're interested in? Converting people, right? The devil is always doing the opposite of what God does. He's the counterfeit. Satan wants converts. 
Okay? He wants people to join his side, just as Jesus wants people to join his side. So let's say you're a citizen in a communist country and you hate communism, you know, because uh, communism stole your wealth, destroyed your family, killed your friends, and imprisoned you. And in a re-education camp, they help you to love communism and hate yourself. That's what they do. And you know, the way that they do that, now this is all just information, this is all just introduction, the way they do that is through repetition and trauma. That's the key to brainwashing. Repetition and trauma. They break your mind so that they can program it into a new normal. And so what you need to realize, whether you, whether you recognize it or not, but what, what you need to start thinking about right now in this country is that is being done to you as an American citizen. When you leave here this morning from this church and you go out into your world and your lives, that whether you watch the news, you don't watch the news, you care about politics, you don't care about politics, you are in agreement with the riots, you're not in agreement with the riots, what is happening is there's people in positions of power in this country that are trying to influence you. They're trying to influence your thinking. And right now, as an American, you are being traumatized through Marxists under the guise of BLM and Antifa destroying your cities and, in some cases, your homes. Okay? It hasn't happened to you. That I, I'm, I'm sure none of you have had that happen to but it could happen to you because it's happened to other Americans in the last few months who thought it would never happen to them. Okay? Have people coming into your yard threatening to kill you and your wife and your kids. You say, well, that's just way over there. It is right now. It could happen to you. It could happen here. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying that's the reality. Uh, right now you're being traumatized by the CDC lying to you about coronavirus, and local governors are using false data to justify the removal of your rights and your liberties as an American citizen. Your kids are having their schooling and their graduation and their sports stopped, and their social lives impacted. That's affecting children, okay? It does affect them. You say, well, that stuff's not important. Only the Bible's important. Okay, think what you want. But kids are being affected whether you believe it or not. These things are affecting children. Being laid off from your job or not being able to find a job due to coronavirus, uh, these are all mental, emotional, financial, and sometimes physical traumas that, are be that the American people are right now being subjected to. Okay? And then there's the repetition. That's the trauma. Now you have the repetition of lies from the news media telling you that you're a racist if you don't support BLM. Okay? Uh, you're a fascist if you voted for Donald Trump. You're a murderer if you don't wear a mask. <laughs> right? If you, do, if you don't wear a mask, you're killing somebody. You know? If you don't want to kill anybody, wear a mask. That's what they tell you in big yellow print on the signs. So I guess that makes me, uh, you know, they could, I guess they could accuse me or charge me with manslaughter. You know, I didn't mean to murder somebody, but I didn't wear my mask today. So, you know, you never know. So, but you have to understand, this is a coordinated, planned attack against you. And this nation is at war right now and is being undermined and attacked by foreign and domestic enemies. And an enemy, whoever you want to identify as the enemy, whatever, there's a lot of different groups that could be described as an enemy. But an enemy is trying to break your mind, trying to break your will, trying to break your morals, trying to break your common sense, okay? And it's much easier for an enemy to do that if you're not aware that it's happening. And I'm telling you that someone is trying to break your mind. They're trying to reprogram it to think how they want you to think. And like those prisoners in re-education camps, you, whether you're as a saved person or as an unsaved person, as, as just a person being subjected to this influence, you need to uh, resist emo uh, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And hopefully, hopefully, you'll, be in, you'll never be put in a position where you're going to have to defend yourself physically. Whether it's somebody trying to break into your home, or whether it's, you know, who knows what can happen. But things are crazy. And every single older person that I've heard of talk about these things, I hear it all the time and without question. They all say the same thing. I've never seen it like this before. I've never seen it like this before. That tells you something. You might be a little bit disinterested in, like I said, politics and the things going on in the country, but you have to understand the things going on in 2020 right now are very unique for this time period in history. 
And this is an important time that you're living in. In the Bible, the times and the seasons have a lot to do with nations. And the times and the seasons, evidently in our world, we can see it before our very eyes. Something about the times and the seasons is starting to change. Because there's some major national upheavals going on right now. Things are changing from the way that they've been for a long time. And as Christians, we need to be paying close attention to what's going on around us and try to discern not politics and who's going to this and that and this. I'm not, that's not all that important. What I, what's very important, though, as a Christian, is we should try to be finding out what is our Father doing? That's what I want to know. What is God doing and what is he about to do? You know, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, speaking of the children of Issachar, one of the tribes of Israel, it says, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Right? That's a good thing. These, that, that, the Bible says that, puts that in a good light. These children of Issachar... They were unique from some of the other tribes of Israel because they had understanding of the times. You know how you get understanding of the times? By spending time in the Word of God. And what does having understanding of the times result in? So that you're able to know what you should do as an individual, what you should do as a family, what you should do as a church, and even maybe give some advice as to what your nation should be doing at this time. That's a good thing. Okay? And uh, one thing that I, that I want to point out here is when it comes to the Bible and when it comes to the future, I already know how this thing ends, okay? We know that there's going to be a rapture, all right? Let's put us at the year 2020 right now, okay? We, I, don't, I don't profess to know the exact year of the rapture, although I have my thoughts. I don't think it's too far away. We know that after that, there's going to be a tribulation, period. And the Antichrist is going to be in the flesh, just as Jesus was in the flesh. Satan is going to be in the flesh, in the person of the Antichrist. And it's going to be a very bad time. And then we know that uh, Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. I also know, from a biblical standpoint, that uh, all the nations uh, that forget God will be turned into hell. I know that all the nations are going to join with the Antichrist. I know that all the nations are going to turn against the Jew in the millennium. That includes the United States of America. Okay? That's fine. What, you say, well, I don't like that, or I do like it. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. That's the Bible. It, so your opinion is immaterial, and mine is too. I know all that. And you, and you know all that. What I want to know, I'm not really work concerned or worried about that. I'm not, get, I'm not interested in trying to change that. It just is what it is. The nations, this country, whether you love it, whether you like it, whether you're indifferent, this country, number one, you're not going to be here for the tribulation if you're saved anyway. All right? So that's good. That's good news. And I'm not really worried about what happens to America in the tribulation. I already know what's going to happen. Okay? What I want to know is, what is God doing right here? From, from now to the rapture, what is God doing? What do we have to expect? I already know all that stuff, and I'm not, and I'm not going to preach. I don't really want to preach on that this morning. I don't really want to preach on, well, we know America is going to be destroyed, blah, blah, blah. Yes, we know. In the tribulation, all that stuff's going to happen. What I'm interested in is where I'm at right here. Because I'm going to be alive, you know, short of a plane crash <laughs> uh, during this time until the Lord comes back, I believe. I believe the Lord will come back in our lifetimes. I want to know right here. That's what I'm interested in. What is God doing right there? Okay. Now, when it comes to trying to find out what's going to happen between now and the rapture, there's a couple things you can look to. Uh, one of the things you can try to find out and get an idea of what's going to happen is looking at the cycles of history. History tends to repeat itself, right? And uh, so we can get a pretty good idea of what happens to a nation by looking at what has happened to nations in the past. And uh, history tells you uh, what happened to nations, but really history can only give you an educated guess as to what is about to happen, okay? You can kind of say, well, our country kind of looks like Germany in the early 30s right now. So we, so we can say, well, it probably is going this way. We can say, well, our country looks a lot like Rome in its last days. So we can probably figure that this is going to happen. But we don't know for sure. Because God reserves the right to be able to change things however he wants. right? So the scriptures and the Holy Spirit are really the best way of knowing 
what's going to happen and what God is doing. And so me personally, I want to know what is God doing and where is all this headed? Okay. And I want this morning to ask the question and I don't know, maybe answer the question. Is there hope for America? Question mark. <laughs> Now, I know, again, I have to re repeat this because pe Bible believers hear this stuff and they think, oh, you're talking politics, blah, blah, blah. There's no hope for America in the tribulation. We know that. There, there's no way the American is going to be a sheep country and protect the Jew. And then in the millennium, it's going to be the right hand to Israel, on, Jesus and Israel on the right and USA on the left. <laughs> I've heard that taught. That's not true. <laughs> that is not going to happen. But I want to know what's going to happen right here while I'm still here, okay? What is God doing? Is there hope for America between now and the rapture, okay? I want to try to avoid oversimplistic answers this morning. I want to try to answer it fairly without being automatically negative or automatically positive, okay? I want to find out what the Bible says, not necessarily what other people have said or are saying. It's been said that America is the modern Sodom and Gomorrah. Has everybody kind of heard that, you know? Granted, Perversion is legal in this country and is becoming more and more accepted. But if we're really honest, is America at the level of Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah yet? I mean, in Genesis chapter 19, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah assaulted an outside visitor that was coming and visiting their city. Now, that kind of thing might happen in some small localities in this country. Maybe in CHOP, something like that would probably happen. But to say that America, an entire nation, a entire country composed of 330 million people, to say that, that America is Sodom and Gomorrah, honestly, I don't think is very accurate. I'm not trying to puff America up. I'm just saying I don't think that that's really true. I don't know about you, but I've never personally had to run from a mob of old and young people who are trying to molest me. I, it's just never happened to me. Uh, maybe it's happened to you, but that's what happened in the book of Genesis at Sodom and Gomorrah. That's never happened to me. I understand that Washington, D.C. is very corrupt. I understand that the news media is very corrupt. I understand that the education is very corrupt. But let me ask you this. What about the American people in general, the average American citizen? Are they that corrupt? We'll look into it a little bit. Yeah. So are the majority of Americans wicked. Okay. Now, this is important here because remember I did some cert some lessons a while ago on the wickedness of the wicked. And if you depending on which church you're in, if you were to ask the question are the majority of Americans wicked, you would get some different answers. Some churches would say absolutely not. We've got our American flag right here. Everybody stand and we'll say the pledge of allegiance. No. And then you'd have some churches that say absolutely. This this nation is Sodom and Gomorrah. It's absolutely wicked. Well, you have to remember that from the Bible, the Lord will look at, a, look at a thing from two standpoints. And you need to be able to rightly divide which one's being used which in the context. There's two standpoints when it comes to the wicked, okay? You have the standpoint from earth and the standpoint from heaven. From heaven's standpoint, every single unsaved person on this planet is wicked, because the criteria is the righteousness of Jesus Christ versus human righteousness. So it doesn't matter how kind your grandma is and nice of a person. If she's unsaved, from heaven's standpoint, she's as wicked as hell. Okay? Because her righteousness is being compared to Jesus Christ's righteousness, and there's no comparison. Amen. Right? So, it, so the only people on earth that are righteous from heaven's standpoint are Christians. Because they have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to them. You see that? There's no gray area there. From heaven's standpoint, it's either light or darkness, black or white, you know, saved and lost. But from earth's standpoint, okay, there's, there's the, the criteria from heaven, okay, is Christ. From earth's standpoint, the criteria, God looks at uh, uh, works, basically, and performance. Not for salvation, but there are some people from the, from the standpoint of earth, and, he, and you see this a lot in the Old Testament especially, there are some people that they're good people. Naaman, he didn't know the God of the Bible, but he took good care of that little Jewish girl. 
He was a good man. But he wasn't saved. He wasn't even a Jew. Okay? So you have some people like that in the Bible, and God, to some extent, in some, depending on what we're talking about, this still applies when it comes to nations and when it comes to rulers. Good works are, let me clarify, works will not get a single person into heaven. But down here, from the standpoint of earth, there is such a thing as wicked people and righteous people, and salvation is not always the criteria. Because from Earth's standpoint, there are some unsaved people that live cleaner, better lives than some Christians, right? And Christians can do some pretty bad things and be very, very wicked. Born-again people, they can do some wicked things. In, from Heaven's standpoint, no matter how wicked a Christian is, he's righteous because he has the, right, the righteousness of Christ imputed to him. But the question is, which standpoint are we looking for? So, I want to point that out. Um, God applies both standpoints throughout the Bible, so you can't always look at everything from just one viewpoint. If I, you know, I cannot just say, well, America is just completely wicked. From Heaven's standpoint, yeah, you could say that. But from Earth's standpoint, is that really true? Is that really true? Certainly there are some groups that are very wicked. There are usually minorities, minority groups. There are some very, very bad minorities in this country. And the, most of the high-ranking politicians are very, very wicked. But again, they're a minority, right? But what of the average American citizen? Uh, these are questions that I've been thinking of for a long time, and I'm looking at my Bible, and I'm trying to think, what is God's mind on these things? What is God doing? What is God thinking? Because as a Christian, I want to know. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, am I the only one that wants to know, or does anybody else wonder these things? Okay, good. All right, so we're all on the same page. Is the average American, saved or lost, are they pro-LGBT? Are they pro-abortion? Are they pro-drag queen story hour? Are they pro-Satanism? Are they pro-communism? No, I'd say probably not. Uh, many are, especially these upcoming generations, age 30 and younger. And my group, you know, age 30 to 40 is a pretty mixed bag. Uh, but the Americans 40 and over still seem, on average, to be a little bit more reasonable when it comes to these things. Okay? And you see this at these big riots. If you were watching any of that on TV, a lot of these people at these riots, you didn't see old people with canes and walkers getting a brick and trying to throw it through the window. You didn't see the old people going through the stores and coming out with a bag full of stuff. You didn't see that. Who were there? It was all these people 30 and younger. Okay? Who do you see at, the, at these big Trump rallies? Generally, for the most part, it's ages 30 and older. A lot of people like that. Now, you do, you, there is a crowd. Obviously, there's a few of each on both sides, but I'm talking about by and large. So, my question is, where are we really at in, rela in relation to God's judgment on this country? And that's what I want to find out. I know that if this country lasts into the tribulation, God will judge it here, sure. Um, and it'll have all the seven trumpets and the vials and the seals poured out on it like any other country. The question that I wonder is, is number one, is the USA going to survive into the tribulation, or is God going to bring judgment on this country before the rapture? Okay, I think that's an interesting question, because if God brings judgment on the America before the rapture, that's something that I'm probably going to experience. I don't particularly want to experience World War III here. Um, I don't, God doesn't care what I think about it or what my preference is, <laughs> but that, I'd, I'd kind of like to know. Is God going to blow up the United States before the rapture? Is God going to sink California into the Pacific before the rapture by the San Andreas Fault? <laughs> uh, is God going to destroy this nation in a single cataclysmic massive volcano from Yellowstone? Uh, will God have China invade this country? Will God have the deep state take over again and surrender our country to the globalists? These are all legitimate questions right now in this country. God could do any of these things. And uh, you know what? He would be completely justified if he did. I wouldn't bat an eye if the Lord did just blow, this, blow a hole the size of Texas in the center of this country and put us into a... You know, a, a ash heap, you know, from this Yellowstone volcano. God can do that. He'd certainly be justified. God, God would not be wrong if that's what happened, you know. Uh, but you know what? God doesn't owe the USA anything, and God does not owe this country any mercy. And I want to also just say real quick that God does not need the USA either. I want to point that out, too. Uh, God has not painted himself into a corner with this country. It's not like God has said, well, you know, uh, I really need to destroy the USA, but I, 
I wasn't really thinking. I had all my missionaries come out of this co- one country, and I had all the most of the money come out of this country, and now I can't destroy the USA, because if I do, <coughs> global missions <coughs> is going to stop. God hasn't painted himself into a corner. <laughs> Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, God can solve any problem that destroying the USA might pose to him. So I'm not going to base my confidence on that. I'm not going to be like, <laughs> God can't destroy this country because all the missionaries come out of here. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I don't think that's very smart. I believe we should maintain a fear of the Lord and a cautious knowledge that God's hammer of judgment can fall at any time. Okay. But I live here, and like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like that to happen. Okay? Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, where you've been at. Look at what Jeremiah says about this thing in uh, verse 15. Because Jeremiah, he lived in a time where his country was destroyed. And he, if you read through Jeremiah and Lamentations, it is not something you want to be a part of. I don't care how tough you think you are, you don't want to go through that. And if there's anything that can be done to prevent having to go through that, that would certainly be in our best interest to try to prevent something like this. Because this is horrific. Words can't even describe some of the things that Jeremiah wrote. Well, words do describe it because he wrote it down. But uh, it, it, I couldn't, you can't even imagine how bad it was. I mean, you read the words and you can't wrap your mind around how bad it is. But it says in verse 15, Jeremiah 17, Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. And, he said, and Jeremiah says this. He says, As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. He was a shepherd before the Lord called him. He says, Neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest. He says, I have not been desiring this. I'm not, I know judgment is coming, but I'm not looking forward to it. I'm going to speak the truth, and God is telling me that judgment is coming, but it's not something that I'm excited about. And I haven't desired it, and I'm not praying for it. <laughs> Jeremiah says, I haven't desired the woeful day. And listen, as a citizen in this country, it is in me in my best interests, and even maybe I could say in the best interests of proclaiming the gospel, you know, that peace and prosperity continue here, right? I'm not excited about the prospect of foreign troops marching down the streets and entering into houses and doing what foreign troops do when they enter into people's houses. That's happened to other countries, and that's happened to some Christians. John and Betty Stamp were there in the Boxer Rebellion in China, and they both got killed. Missionaries! It happens. I'm not thrilled about watching my family starve, trying to survive off rations of rice. I'm not excited or looking forward to the day when I get arrested for baseless charges and get shipped off to a FEMA camp and have to wonder how my family is doing and if I'll ever see them again. But that stuff happens to people. And don't be so naive as to think it cannot happen here. That's the first first clue that you are completely deceived (laughs) if you think that cannot happen here. It's better to understand that can happen here. That's the reality. And is there anything I can do to prevent something like that from happening? Okay. Um, God's grace is sufficient to get you through anything, but God does not promise to prevent bad things from happening to you. Okay. And so my focus, like I said, is, is there hope for America? Is there any hope? Because things have been really bad. And is God going to destroy this country before we get out of here? And some Christian would say that God's hammer is falling right now. And we are seeing the final destruction of America before our very eyes with all this crazy stuff going on. Some would say that judgment is coming, but God has given us a reprieve and maybe even a chance to repent. And then some say that no judgment will come at all, and we are seeing revival, hallelujah. (laughs) And uh, honestly, I throw the idea of revival happening right out the window, okay? I don't believe that revival is happening right now. I sort of wonder the people that say the revival is happening if they even know what a revival is. (laughs) Uh, I don't see any repentance happening. You have to have repentance in order to have revival. Look at Jeremiah chapter 18. This is what God says to any nation, not just Israel, okay? Any nation, this goes for any nation, including America. uh, Jeremiah 18, verse 7. At what instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent. That's what repent means, to turn. If they turn, I'll turn. If they turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. 
And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. That sounds pretty fair, right? Yeah, that's fair. All right. So I don't think, I know for, I'm sure, repentance, turning from sin is not happening right now. This country is still just kind of going on its same downward declension when it comes to morality and character in this country. All right. So that leaves us with either God's hammer is falling right now and the city's burning and BLM going through and all this stuff going on and all these problems, the coronavirus, either this is God's hammer of judgment falling upon us right now. And we're just seeing a slow motion hammer smash through this country or we're seeing some reprieve and are given a little bit of time to repent. Uh, in John Stormer's book, Death of a Nation, he wrote the book, uh, None Dare Call It Treason. That was his first book. And then he got saved after writing the book. And he wrote a second book that incorporated the Bible and uh, called it uh, The Death of a Nation. And he said, America today, and he wrote this in 1968, must look forward to either revival or revolution or the return of Jesus Christ. That's the third option. Either we're going to have a revival with repentance or there's going to be a revolution. And the only thing that's going to prevent either one of those two things from happening, and I don't see revival coming, so revolution is coming. The only thing that might prevent that from happening and coming to fullest fruition would be the return of Jesus Christ. And I think it's easy to look around and assume that this is it. You know, judgment's here. God's wrath is falling on this nation. I mean, just look around you. Okay, I think that's easy to look at that and, uh, and uh, you know, think that this is the end. But I, I personally don't really think that's what's happening. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of why. I'm going to give you my opinion this morning, and that's all it is. It's just my opinion, and I could be wrong. But my opinion is based on something I see in the Bible, so I'd like you to take it into consideration this morning. I don't think America is at its end yet. Okay, we got a lot of bad things happening in this country right now, and a lot of people are really freaked out, and a lot of people are really scared. But I don't think we're at the end yet. And I don't base this off of wishful thinking or positive thinking. Okay. Um, I base this off of some things I see in the Bible and some things I see in prophecy and some things I see in this country right now. And even though things are really bad, I don't think God is going to destroy it yet or even let it be destroyed by our enemies within and without. I think America right now is going through some fires that we absolutely deserve. And it appears to me that God still has some use left for this beast called America. Because bear in mind, all Gentile nations are called beasts in the Bible, even America. Okay. Now, of course, this country has really bad iniquity in it, and all nations have natural sins that natural unsafe people commit. It's when a nation's sins become very abnormal and become very uh, much uh, unnatural and against nature, and when justice is turned upside down, that's when God will bring a hammer down on a country. Okay? You can't expect any nation to be a Christian nation. There's no such thing. Okay? Uh, every nation is full of unsafe people. Unsafe people will always be the majority. Okay? And unsafe people are going to do what unsafe people do. You say, what do unsafe people do? They do what comes natural to them. And a lot of things that are natural for unsafe people are things that God doesn't want them doing. Okay? But when things go from the natural to the unnatural... That's when you start having a demonism coming in, and that's where you start getting into these perversions that the Bible talks about in the book of Leviticus. And God said, these nations were doing these abominations, and that's why I'm bringing you in to destroy them. Not because they're doing the things, you know, natural things that come natural, fornication, lying, the typical sins. Those are normal for a nation. God doesn't destroy a nation just for doing what comes normal to them. It's when these abnormal things come in is when God really starts punishing a country. Look at Ezekiel chapter 16 real quick. Ezekiel chapter 16. It's the abnormal things and the violate, massive violations of justice that uh, bring the wrath of God down on a country. Ezekiel 16, and somebody would say, well, no, that's not true, because Ezekiel 16.49 says this. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride... Fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So people would say, well, look, Sodom and Gomorrah, it wasn't the sodomy that got them destroyed. It was the fact that they were uh, uh, proud. 
They were full of bread. They were abundance of idleness. They weren't helping the poor and needy. And so therefore, God destroyed them. And America is right there. Well, so is every other country on the planet, practically, except for third world countries. <laughs> Any first world country is right there. But that's not why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And I believe that that's usually preached the wrong way. It gives you these things, and then it says, and they committed abomination. That's what the destruction was for, was the abomination. Therefore, because of the abomination, I took them away. If they hadn't crossed that line into that uh, sodomite lifestyle, God might have spared them. Because all nation, oh, most nations are proud and fullness of bread and abundance of vials. These are the things that led to those unnatural sins, right? Those are all going on. It's when they crossed the line and committed abomination, God says, up, oh, time's up, okay? <clears throat> so it's not these things that God brought fire and brimstone down on a country for. Otherwise, we would say, well, absolutely, God should bring fire and brimstone down on this country. We've been proud and full of bread and abundance of idleness for a long time. This country has begun to cross that line, especially when our last president made uh, homosexual marriages legal. Okay. But that was only a few years ago. Okay. So I don't think we're quite to the extent that Sodom and Gomorrah was at yet, but we're getting closer. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I want you to consider something. There's a lot of people in this country that really are against this kind of corruption. They would love to see the LGBT drag time story hour pedophilic garbage removed from society. I know I would. I think there's a lot of even unsafe people that would like that, right? But these people, myself included, really have no control over that, right? Uh, we, have, we, don't, we can control what comes into our homes and into our lives, but we can't really control what this country does. People would say, well, of course, yes, you can. You can vote. Get somebody into office. Just vote the, good, the bad people out and the good people in, and then we could clean up society. Uh, it doesn't work that way. It's supposed to work that way, but it really doesn't. That's a noble but the naive way of looking at things. Because that's not taking into account that right now the voting is rigged. Okay? That's not taking into account right now that the people running for office, a lot of times they fake it and lie until they make it, and then they're the complete opposite of who you voted in. And also, the good men who somehow do make it into office are often targeted and then corrupted or bribed or blackmailed, and now they're worthless. And then uh, the good men who do somehow make it into office and do try to be good, they're completely surrounded by a bunch of vipers and snakes and spiders, and they can't get anything done. Nothing. And so the average American citizen that hates seeing what's going on, they see all this stuff, but there's nothing they can do about it because the way this country is set up is the lawmakers, they just pass whatever wickedness that they want to pass. And they don't care what the American people think, as we've seen in this state and in this country. So, what are we, so is God going to destroy us for what these minority of wicked demons are doing? Do we get destroyed for that? Did we have a part in that? I don't know about you, but I didn't get a vote on, a, on abortion. I didn't get a vote on gay marriage. Uh, none, of we, none, of we, none of us did. The average American citizen, they hate that stuff, I think. at least, I'm, And maybe some of them more so than others. But I don't think America is very pleased with what's going on in this country right now. And our, America, our country has been hijacked by very wicked people. And so my question is, would God destroy a country for that? Would God destroy a nation full of people who, by and large, are against this kind of stuff? And I think we're starting to see that. They're called the silent majority. We're starting to see some of that with these big rallies okay, that Donald Trump is doing. It's just a, kind of taking the pulse of our nation to see what the people are really like. I think the people of America, by and large, they want law and order. They want justice. Do you, does the average American citizen, does he kind of seem a little bit more like, do they seem like Nancy Pelosi and AOC? Or is the average American citizen probably a little bit more like Donald Trump? I think most of America is probably on this side. So again, the question is, would God destroy a nation whose majority is not saved, but on the side of desiring at least some justice and law and order? Or would he destroy a nation who has a minority of very wicked people who have finagled their way into the top and have really subjecting this other group to things that they don't want to be subjected to? I think that's an interesting question. God does not destroy countries for not being saved. And he doesn't destroy countries for not being sinlessly perfect. 
He destroys nations for violating nature and violating justice. And like I said, the majority of people are not, in, are not in favor of those. Our Justice Department has forced these things on our nation. Now, I want to kind of wrap this up a little bit. I know I'm, well, I'm not going too long yet. But uh, consider this. Let's say you have uh, the Gomorrah family. Okay, this Gomorrah family, the whole family is wicked. Dad's wicked, mom's wicked, the kids are wicked. Everybody is just totally debauched and horrible. And uh, if they were all in a vehicle driving on a family vacation and then they lost control and their brakes went out and they flew over a cliff and blew up and died, most of us would think, oh, well, that's the judgment of God and we would not be too overly concerned about that. We wouldn't be like, wow, how could this have happened? <laughs> We'd say, well, that was God's hand doing that. But now consider this other family, okay? The mom is very wicked. And she gets a new boyfriend every four to eight years. And uh, usually every boyfriend is very wicked, too. She didn't start this way. She uh, started out actually very good. And her first husbands, you know, they were mostly deists. Maybe some of them were Christians. But at the very least, her initial husbands were deists. And they were moral men with character and, and integrity. And this, uh, maybe they were Illuminati members. I don't know. But that's a whole other subject for another time. But uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, mother and father and their children were the envy of the world at one time. But as time went on and she started hanging, she started hanging out with this scarlet woman over in Rome. And this scarlet woman was a very bad influence to this other woman. And, uh, some, and she, this woman became more and more corrupt until, and she began finding very corrupt boyfriends. Okay? And some of the kids saw this awful change and they abhorred it. Uh, some of the kids liked all the sin and debauchery that were coming into the family. There were some like that. Most of the kids just wanted to be kids and live their own life, mind their own business. Uh, they wanted to be nice to people, do their own thing. They weren't necessarily bad kids or good kids. They were just your average kids okay, in this family. Let me ask you something. What does God see in this family? What does God look at? Do you think God would destroy this family like he destroyed the Gomorrah family? It's an interesting question. Yes, mom and dad are very corrupt, but, you know, the majority of the kids aren't like mom and dad. And sure, God could destroy that family because of the parents. Sure. But would he? Would he be as eager to destroy them as he was the Gomorrah family? And knowing the Lord, I think God would look on this family. This is my opinion. God would look on this family. He would see a very corrupt mother and father, but he would see some, some of the kids are actually very good kids and trying to do good. Some of the kids are just average, and then a couple of kids are bad. I think the Lord would probably spare that family for the sake of those good kids, if, knowing my father. And uh, the reason why the wicked mom and dad would be able to continue was solely because of those good kids and God's mercy on some of the average kids. I think that's at least a fair and reasonable assessment, honestly. Now think about this. Um, would God destroy all of America for the debauchery of a minority when the American citizen, average citizen, does not really approve of the abominations going on in this country? I think that's interesting to think about. One uh, other quick little illustration here. Let's say you're playing a game, and uh, how can a person who keeps the rules <clears throat> win the game against a cheater? Let's say you're playing the game of Monopoly, and you're playing by the rules, and you've got four players, right? And uh, three other players are cheating. The other three players are cheating, and one of them is the banker. <laughs> uh, what are your chances of winning that game? <laughs> the answer is you cannot win. Let's just be honest. I mean, the, the, you cannot win. There are only two possible outcomes in a scenario where you're playing Monopoly, and the other three are corrupt, and one of them is the banker. You can, be, you can give in and become a cheater also and start cheating and trying to win that way. And that's the easy option for people with no character and no morals. Or the second thing you can do is you can continue to play by the rules and eventually get defeated. But you did the right thing. You didn't cheat, you did the right thing, but you lost in the end. That's the honorable thing to do, and that'd be the right way to be, but you'd still lose. Humanistically speaking, those are your only two options. You cannot win Monopoly under those circumstances. I don't care what kind of books you're reading or what kind of movies you're watching. You will not win <laughs> in the, under those kind of circumstances. But there is then suddenly one more option, but it doesn't pertain to this world or humans per se. There's a third option where God could do a miracle. God could have mercy on you and do a miracle, and suddenly you're the banker. Oh, well, that just made this game very interesting. 
These other three are still cheaters, and you're trying to play by the rules, but now you're the banker. Okay, so now what are your options? Well, number one, you could uh, now that you're the banker, you can cheat, and you can just be corrupt and destroy your enemies through corruption. But what would God do to you in that situation? He would destroy you, right? Or the other option is you can continue to do right as the banker and try to beat the cheaters who are still trying to cheat and are teamed up against you. That would be an interesting game. You might win, you might lose. That'd be a tough one, right? That'd be a tough situation. And it kind of seems like our country had those options, right? A person could in this country could get ahead by becoming a cheater. We got a lot of those in our country. Or a person could do the right thing and get trampled on and eventually probably be in prison and persecuted. That's kind of where we were at. But then God did an interesting thing in 2016. God did a miracle. And anytime God performs a miracle, it fascinates me. Now, this isn't just me waving a Donald Trump flag or anything like that. Let me tell you, what happened in 2016 was a miracle. Israel coming back into the land in 1948 was a miracle. Lazarus being raised from the dead was a miracle. Blind Bartimaeus getting his sight was a miracle. Donald Trump being elected in 2016 was a miracle. That cannot have happened unless God had done it. You say, no, the silent majority voted. If God didn't want him in office, he would not be in office. It was not the necessarily the silent majority. Maybe God used that. But the, this nation was so corrupt, and they did everything in their power to try to have that election go the way they wanted, and that would have probably been the last nail in the coffin for our country. We'd probably already be under Chinese dictatorship right now if Hillary had gotten in. And that's not even an overstatement. We might have been in World War III. But God did a miracle. My father did that. And that's why I'm interested, and that's why I'm fascinated, and that's why I'm paying very close attention to what's going on, because I, I thought for sure that's where we were going based on what we probably deserved. But then God did something really strange. And now we've seen this really weird outpouring of hatred for this man, who I don't even know if he's saved. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. It doesn't make no difference to me. But he's the ruler of the country. God put him there. And he seems to be someone who loves law and order. He wants justice. He's trying to do his best, and he's not corrupt like Obama and, Pres and, 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 Clint and the Clintons and the Bushes were. He's not a Skull and Bones member. He's not perfect, but he's not like them. He's trying to do his best, and when a ruler sits on a throne, let me ask you, when has God ever destroyed a country where a man sat on the throne who tried to do the right thing and to the best of his knowledge, uh, exercise law and order and justice? When has God ever destroyed a country with a ruler like that on the throne? I can't think of one. I find it really interesting what God did there. I could see the Lord destroying our country with an Obama or a Clinton on a throne. But would God destroy us with Donald Trump on the, in the highest place of power? Now listen, my hope is not in Donald Trump. My hope is in God who put Donald Trump in power. I'm interested in what my father is doing. As a matter of fact, the Bible says there in Jeremiah chapter 17... Do not get me wrong. The Bible says, don't put your confidence in princes, and I'm not. My confidence is not in Donald Trump. If the Lord wants him out of office, he'll be out of office like that. But the fact that they've tried to impeach him three times now, and they've done all these things against him, and, and with the amount of scrutiny they're doing on this guy, if he was a pedophile, they would have found it by now. They would have found a lot of things by now if he was as wicked as some of these Christians just kind of throw out these accusations. Well, he's wicked. Well, how? Yeah, so he's messing with women in his younger days. Again, that's a natural sin for a natural unsaved man. That's not an abomination per se. Pedophilia is an abomination that the Clintons and the Obamas and the Bushes were involved in. Okay? So we got to keep things in perspective. Jeremiah 17, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. Verse 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. That's where my hope is in, is what God is doing. I want to know what God is doing. God has done an extraordinary miracle, and to me, the fact that God did that in 2016, He didn't have to let that. God could have walked away, let America go the direction it was heading, and we would have plunged straight into hell. But God did something weird, and the fact that He did an extraordinary miracle is evidence to me that God is doing something unique right now, and as Christians, 
we should not be quick to dismiss that. Okay? You know what? <clears throat> There's some law and order coming back into this country. Now think of this. God saw a family with a wicked mom and dad and a few really wicked kids. But some of the kids were saved and hated the abominations in their home. And like I said, some of the other kids were just your average kids. So in 2016, God did something interesting. He removed a wicked, a wicked boyfriend out of the picture and brought in a different boyfriend. And this boyfriend, uh, you know, this, the woman, she was actually going to try something new that they've never tried before. And she was going to try to get a girlfriend for the first time. But instead, God brought in a boyfriend. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this man was far from perfect. And like I said, this man may or may not be saved. But this man wanted to clean the house up. He wanted to be a good father. He wanted to try to be the best husband he could be. Okay. And to this woman. And he has quite the job. Some of the kids love him. Absolutely love him. Some of the kids are a little indifferent and still don't care. Some of the kids absolutely hate him, <laughs> and, and they want him to die. Uh, the, <laughs> the bad kids hate this new dad because the mom hates him. The mom acts all nice and sweet and, you know, talks about, oh, yes, well, and, and reluctantly does what he says. But behind his back, when she's on social media with all her friends, she cuts him down left and right. She's always undermining him to the kids, right? She's a very wicked woman. She hates this. She's a real witch. And her kids are little devils, a lot of them. And there's a lot of fighting in the home. Yes, but let me ask you something. Will God destroy a home like that with that man as the head of the household? Do you think God would destroy a home like that? Just bring the hammer down on it? When you have a man, or would God honor or at least bless the authority figure in that home who's trying to do his best? I think, I, I wonder about that. Would not God rather bless that authority figure, regardless of how wicked his wife is and a few of those kids? Would he not rather say, you know what, that guy's trying. He's not even saved. But from her standpoint, you know what, he's doing what he's supposed to do as a father. Yeah, he needs salvation. But you know what, as a father, he's trying to lead his wife. He's trying to raise his kids. He's trying to do a good job. And God says, I like that. He's not even saved. He's doing a better job than some of the saved people. <laughs> some of my children, he's a better person than some of my children. I find that interesting. So, finally, I know this lesson was very political, and like I said, this isn't the normal for me. This is just kind of different. But I want to know, is there hope for America, or is God going to destroy us? Because it seems like we are teetering on the edge right now. And I think we're all kind of wondering what's going to happen, if we're honest. But based on the fact that God delights in mercy, He does. He really does. And God did a miracle a few years ago. And God blesses just rulers. He does. And God blesses the man of character who tries to do his best to do what's right, regardless of what everybody else is doing around him. Okay? It makes me think that God is not done with this country yet. It makes me think that uh, I'm of the opinion personally that God gave this country President Trump. You know, again, I didn't say that he was the angel of the Lord. Okay. You know, get it right. I believe that the Lord did that for this country. And I'm very thankful that he did that. <laughs> Man, we didn't deserve that. Uh, I think God personally, this is just me, my opinion. I think God's going to keep him in office for four more years because I don't think God is done with him yet. And I'm glad for that. Uh, I, I think that, the, that no person on earth could remove him out of office as long as God wants him there. And I think that really frustrates some very wicked people in this country. <laughs> and I, they probably do. And, they're, and uh, they're trying their best through uh, all kinds of means to get him out. But they just cannot get him out. And I think it blows their minds. I don't think they, some of these people are atheists. They don't even know why. How is it possible that he could still be in office after all that they've tried to do? And it won't work. I think God is going to use Trump to break the deep state. I really do. And I find that very interesting. I think God is going to use Trump to diminish Rome. And I've talked about that before. And I think God is going to use Donald Trump to get the temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. And uh, I think this justice and blessing of Israel is going to, uh, you know, trying to help Israel. And some of his ways of trying to help is not really that helpful, but he's trying. Okay. I think it's going to result in massive prosperity in this country more than we've ever been seen before. I really do. I think we're next year, in the next couple of years, we're going to see some unbelievable prosperity in this country. And I think that is what's finally going to bring everybody down. That's going to bring the church down, and that's going to end up bringing this country down. I think this country is just going to skyrocket financially, and it's going to plummet spiritually. I think we're going to see a weird dynamic right there. And so, like I've said before, prepare for prosperity. Or maybe I should say, 
beware of prosperity because things are going to change drastically in this country, I believe. We're going to see a revival of, of justice, law and order. I believe we're going to see people arrested. And it's not because I watch, I'm, I, I'm watch Q and all that stuff or I'm one of these Q followers. I think that stuff is a Pentagon psyop most of the time. I'm not, it's, that's not where I'm getting my information from. I read my Bible and I, I think that's what God's going to do. I think he's going to allow these people to go to jail. I think we might see Hillary for prison here pretty soon. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I would love to see that. But that doesn't mean that a revival is happening in this country. And a lot of Christians will misunderstand and misinterpret the law and order being and the exercise of justice and the prosperity for a revival. They'll think gain is godliness. And that's going to be the thing that's going to finally put the church in the condition that we find in Revelation chapter 3 where she's rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing but knoweth not that she's wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So just some things to think about. You don't have to agree with me this morning but I've been thinking about this for a while and that's, that's my opinion of what I think is going on, what I think the Lord is doing and uh, just think about it throughout the week and then uh, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled preaching and teaching next Sunday and the following. Alright, let's pray. Father, I come before you.